In today's training, I want to talk about the three, uh, what I call revenue streams to diversity, or excuse me, to federal revenue. You might think about it the same way as three paths to federal revenue. But the whole idea of why I teach this is diversity of uh, access to the revenue, diversity of the revenue types. And I'll talk a lot more about that in the training. But just from a higher level, when you think about this from a tip perspective, you really want to diversify your risk. You, you think about this if you you're you know if you're investing uh, for retirement things like that you want to diversify your investments so you don't lose it all in an you know an apple stock crash or something and so you diversify to make sure you're reducing the risk and you're also uh, when it comes to going after revenue you're increasing your opportunities so you're diversifying or reducing your risk and increasing your opportunities i um, had this problem back uh, my last company when i started it for the first few years, we were just doing really, really well with Booz Allen being our prime contractor where we had a ton of business. I mean, we we're just kind of rolling in the dough. We were feeling so proud of ourselves, but we didn't really pay attention to the fact that we were not diversified at all. And uh, there was this sequestration, if you haven't seen this with the government, where they just did all sorts of spending cuts. I mean, massive spending cuts instantly. And that hit Booz Allen, who turned to us and said, sorry, fellas, so they cut our contracts with them and, and they didn't have anything special. We were basically uh, three month contracts and they're like, yeah, when this contract's done, we're done. And so we lost 80 percent of our revenue in there. Now, it was a really good lesson for us, because if your company doesn't die from that, you grow stronger. Um, but we really learned and I learned way back, you know, 10 plus years ago, the, the massive value of federal government about diversifying. And that's why I want to talk about the three paths to federal revenue, because um, often I hear all sorts of people talk about uh, prime contracting when you come into the government. And I don't just mean consultants who are out there, uh, you know, doing videos and training just like I am or, or things like that. They're advocating um, priming. But I mean, the P tax, the small business administrator, others who talk about prime contracting to people who are brand new. It's like, no, 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 no. Take your time. There's a couple other paths you can do. And we're going to talk about that because prime contracting is great, but it is not um, necessary right away. And it is not the only path. When you're a large multi-billion dollar business, you're going to swim in all three of these revenue streams. And so I want to make sure you smalls are doing the same thing. And we'll talk about that, right? The, the three revenue streams that these federal dollars are coming down through. And I want to make sure you know them, because if you know them, then you'll be able to pursue them. Uh, and that's literally what we're going to talk about today, how and where federal agencies award contracts. Um, there's three revenue streams or revenue paths that I talk about. The first one is subcontracting under small. Second one is prime contracting with federal agencies. And the third one is subcontracting under a large business. Um, and so I want to talk to you about how to pursue it, give you some tips on uh, how to succeed. But the most important thing from today's training that I want you to take away is that the federal dollars are up here, that gray cloud. It's a really big pot of money. But the way that money comes out to industry is in three different paths. And if you're only pursuing one path, then you're only going after 30 percent of the federal dollars compared to if you have a strategy to do all three of these, then you really increase your likelihood. If you're brand new to government contracting, let's say a year or less or a million dollars or less, then don't focus on larges. Right. We'll talk about that in a minute. Focus on the other ones. But at some point, you're going to hit this stage where you're swimming in all three uh, revenue streams. You should have a strategic plan for 2025. How am I gonna get revenue from each one of these revenue paths or streams? So that's what we're gonna talk about today. That's how, how I'm gonna talk about it. If you don't know who I am, my name is Neil McDonald. I am the president of the GovCon Chamber and co-founder of GovCon in a Box, a tool I'll talk about in a minute. I wanna welcome you to my federal sales training where I provide tips for success in the federal market. I spent 20 years in the federal market as a small business owner. And since 2018, I've been helping people like you understand that government contracting is not a secret. It's just a process. When we follow a process A to Z, we're going to have repeatable, predictable results. And that's what I want for you. It's why I deliver this training about the how of federal sales every single day. If you haven't subscribed to our newsletter, subscribe. It's Government Contracting Success Newsletter here on LinkedIn. Ton of great content out there. We also that's where we let people know about the trainings. And so if you're coming to the trainings, you want to hear about new ones, you'll hear about it through that. Um, but join us over there and then join us in tomorrow's training. I've got it uh, listed here. Maybe somebody's got a link in the chat already, but it's a seven step process for winning federal 
uh, contracts. This is where I took the complex process that people sometimes describe in the federal government, what I call a billion dollar process. And I brought it down and created a small business process uh, for federal success. And so it's just seven steps on um, how do you move forward? How do you achieve success? And in that training, you'll hear me also talk about how do you identify where you're having the challenges? When you have a process, you can see where the problem is in the process and address it. Um, so today, part of the process is talking about train or uh, dollars, and we're going to get to that. I did want to congratulate three new companies to the 100 Club. Uh, these companies, you can see them at the bottom, Barker and Barker Consulting with Vaughn, uh, Up Doppler Consulting with Chris, and Virtual Ops Services with Jessica. They just uh, did what it takes in GovCon and a box.com to be able to increase their visibility with federal buyers. This is not something that um, is proprietary inside. The data is not proprietary. The data is all in the government tools. All I'm doing is encouraging you to get out there and be uh, visible to federal buyers. There are 360,000 small businesses in the federal market. When the federal buyer comes looking for you, you want to be visible. And so we created the 100 Club to be able to um, demonstrate and give you guidance on what it takes to get to that stage. It's free. You can take a look at it at govconinabox.com. But congratulations to Vaughn, Chris, and Jessica for doing that hard work to uh, become visible. And then congratulations to the other 100 clubs as well. Uh, it's, it's super exciting to have you in here. I am going to bring you together and, and you will be the foundation of a new community where you're helping each other and you're being able to, being able to um, support each other towards success as it makes sense. Okay, let's dive into pursuing uh, the first revenue stream, right? Revenue as a subcontractor under small businesses. What I'm gonna talk about can be valuable to the larger businesses, certainly even uh, you know hundred million dollar companies. But I like to make sure we're bringing along people who just are coming into government contracting if they get here. And so if you don't know, subcontracting is when company A gets a contract with the federal government to do something for a million dollars. And they say, hey, can you do something for 50 to 100,000 in support of it? So if there's seven tasks, they might give you one task. You are working for the prime contractor who got the contract with the government. It's actually commercial work for you, even though you're supporting the federal government. But that's all subcontracting is, right? And so in this case, we're talking about subcontracting under small businesses. And the reason this is important is because uh, the federal government awards contracts to prime contractors. And those prime contractors are one of two types. They are small businesses or they are large businesses. And there's a size standard the SBA determines that says whether you're small or large. But for the most part, if you go to dsbs.sba.gov, you can find all the um, small businesses in there and their size determination by the SBA. A quicker way is to go through GovCon in a box because we have a great tool. Um, but $176 billion went to small businesses. This is not magical uh, um, contract or federal spending that went on uh, battleships or paying for Social Security, all these things. This is literally, or um, yeah, literally contracts that were awarded to small businesses to support the federal government to the tune of $176 billion last year. So that was FY 2023. And when I say small businesses, I mean, uh, some contracts were set aside to total small business, which means we don't care if you're a veteran or woman, this is set aside for a small business, any designation, as long as you're small. And then contracts were set aside to 8A small businesses. That's, that's different, right? There's sole source contracts and there's uh, set aside contracts in particular for 8A. And so um, those companies got contracts, all part of the 176. Hub zone firms, if you're not familiar with the historically underutilized business zones, uh, think about Oklahoma, where, you know, compared to uh, San Francisco, it doesn't really have hub zones, but Oklahoma, most of Oklahoma is. And so hub zones got set aside. Women-owned small business and service-disabled, veteran-owned small businesses got set aside. And when you're thinking about that and you're thinking about subcontracting, these are the type of companies you can be looking for. There is no other designation to pay attention to. Right, uh, minority, for example, does not matter as it relates to the 176 billion because there's no set aside for that. Um, it's done through other ways. And same thing with women-owned small businesses, self-designation doesn't matter. It's the SBA certification as you move forward. That's the only one that counts. All right, so 176 billion, you want a piece of that. Whether you're a billion dollar firm or you just gotten started, that's a lot of money to want to get a piece of it um, and see how you can team up with one of those small business winners 
to support their needs while also generating revenue for you. So I put here in the middle that in red, I don't know if you're seeing it, but um, small business prime contractors, when they're thinking about working with you, they care most about whether you can help them win, whether you and they can win together. They're the most friendly to small businesses like you, in my opinion, because they remember what it was like to be your size or they remember what it was like to be trying to team up to get into an agency or to go after an opportunity. And so these folks just wear, uh, they care most about, can we win together? If we come together, can we win together? And that's just the normal uh, level of thinking. So uh, one of the reasons I really like subcontracting under small businesses is they've already established relationships at agencies. So if you're a little bit more mature company, 5 million plus, 100 million, or even a billion dollar company, billion dollar companies follow this process, right? They're trying to get into a particular agency. They see a small doing well. They'll come over and try to team up with them and get on a uh, an opportunity that either they have or they're going after. And, um, and you want to do that same thing, right? If you're trying to get into the army, go find companies that have won in the army. I like to suggest that you want to have eight strategic small business partners. These are people, um, teammates, right? If you can think about that, but these are eight companies that are committed to mutual growth. You're going to help them in any way you can to, to drive towards their goals. And they're going to do the same thing for you. In this particular conversation, you're hoping that they're going to be the ones who help you get into the army or into HHS as you team together. But a strategic partner is different than just a networking uh, partner or person you know, right? A strategic partner is one that comes together and says, let's meet every two weeks, 15 minutes and talk about our mutual pipeline driving forward. You don't talk about everything. You just talk about what you two can work together towards. When you find those eight strategic partners, truly do the work to find them, you will begin to have success. And subcontracting under small allows you to grow, especially if you're fairly new to government contracting. Um, okay, so that's one revenue stream. The next revenue stream is um, pursuing prime contracts as a government contractor, right? And just for a refresher for people who are new to government contracting, the federal government, when they award a contract to a company, that company is the prime contractor. It doesn't matter whether that company is a product company, a construction company, or a services company. The company that signs the contract with the government is the prime contractor, right? And so that's what you want to uh, pursue when you're ready. You want to pursue those type of contracts because the government spent $745 billion in total contract award out there in 2023. That means they're spending a lot of money. You need to take that $745 billion and really break it down and go, well, how much did they spend on what um, what I do? And how much really is it? So if you think you're a cybersecurity company, come farther down on the cyber spend that the government awarded contracts on. Do you do risk management frame, uh, risk management framework or RMF? Man, I'm I'm kind of losing my thought on that, but you know, you come down farther and you go, what are we doing? You know what? We just do uh, pen testing, penetration testing from a cybersecurity perspective. Well, how much of that 745 was cyber and then was pen testing? And it, and it could be massive drop down. But by understanding that, you see what potential contract value you have and what you can pursue. And so if you're trying to pursue large con or prime contracts, um, then you can go after that. The thing I want you to understand, and this is really, really important, the government doesn't care that you're a woman-owned small business or a veteran-owned, like I'm a vet, right? They don't care. They don't care about the goals they set. People care. So, you know, we might have David Waltz on today. I don't know if he's on. I know he cares. He's here every single day engaging industry. He cares about small businesses and how we can support the Navy. He cares about the goals that he's going for. But agencies and the government themselves, they really don't care about the goals. And the number one way I know they don't care about the goals, they don't hit them. If they cared about them, they'd hit them. But the number of times you can look out and see that they're out there and they haven't hit their goals um, is makes it really obvious that they don't care. That's not a priority for them. And I'm not saying this to knock them. What I'm trying to say is it's important for you to understand, well, if they don't care about that, what do they care about? What they care about is mission support, success of the mission. If you come in, can you help us deliver on the mission we have? That's all it is. We have to serve veterans in the VA and make sure we're providing quality health care to take care of our veterans. We're uh, protecting our borders. We're teaching our children. Whatever it is that the agency does, and that's their mission, 
and the customer inside that agency, what's their even tighter mission, that's what they care about. They don't care about hitting goals. They care about delivering on the mission and, they're, uh, and they understand your value, industry's value. And so when you come in, you want to make sure you're talking about that as you're going after prime contracts. But don't try to go after a prime contract saying, hey, we can help you hit your goal or we see you're not hitting your goal. Um, you can watch all sorts of other training I've done in the past where I say, never go after an agency that's missing its goal. Go after an agency that's hitting it. The way we think sometimes is that, well, if they're hitting their goal, they don't need me there. But if they're missing their goal, they need me. And what I like to say is, if they're missing their goal, they don't care about you. But if they're hitting their goal, they're happy to exceed their goal. And so find a, uh, an agency that is really buying from companies like yours. If you're thinking about those small business tags that we might have, like service disabled, veteran owned or woman owned, et cetera. Um, one of the things I, I like to point out is uh, here, what it, when I talk about um, what a, a person on the other side of the table looks for, it depends on who they are. And so if they're an agency, they look for one thing. If they're a large prime, they look for another. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But an agency, and this is my experience opinion, is that first and foremost, they're looking for your core competency. What do you do? Where do you fit? And past performances that show you're good at it. Because again, they care most about the ability to deliver on the mission. Uh, they're not caring about some of these other uh, secondary things. And, and they're only secondary because mission is primary, right? And so they want to see that you've got a solid expertise around your core competency and you've got past performance that demonstrates that you're good at that and you've been paid for that, right? And so you want to build that experience out there. Um, if you're newer to the federal space, if you're newer to the agency, then start with small business subcontracting, what I uh, talked about before and start with small prime contracts within an agency. Don't try to go for real big ones, but start building past performances around your core competency that allow you to go from $100,000 contracts to million dollar contracts to $10 million contracts, right? Don't start with a $10 million one. That's not the normal path and progress, right? Crawl, walk, run. Um, and then when you work with smalls as well, uh, you can build up past performance as a subcontractor. Some agencies, when you go after prime contracts, will totally um, support a subcontract as a um, past performance. What they're looking for again is what are you an expert at and have you been paid for it? So just keep that in mind as you think about prime contracts, they care most about mission support. So if you want to get a piece of that $745 billion spend that happens each year, then make sure you understand how your company fits with their mission. So the uh, third one, the third revenue stream here is subcontracting under large prime contractors. And in this particular case, right, a large prime contractor is similar to a small business contract, prime contractor, right? They won the contract with the federal government. So they're the prime and you will support them in any way they do that. Now, the difference between a small business and a large business is a large business might have, you know, a billion dollar or, or tens of billions of dollars size contracts where you're, you're having a much bigger piece of the pie in there, but it's the same as a small. They've got the contract with the government and you're gonna support it in one way or another in this particular task area. Um, and so when you just think about the size out there, 575 billion point two, right? A little change, but $575 billion went to large prime contractors, what we call other than small. And, and that's a huge thing to pay attention to. A hundred and what was it? One hundred and fifty or one hundred seventy-five to smalls and five hundred seventy-five to larges. This is a big deal, a huge chunk of money. So if you're a small business, you want to make sure you're looking at getting a piece of this five hundred seventy-five. You're also uh, pursuing prime contracts yourself, and you're looking at that third stream of small businesses. The um, the kicker about that five hundred seventy-five billion, and I'm going to say this in very general terms, right? It's not a uh, hard and fast number, but for the general for general purposes, large businesses have been delegated the responsibility to work with small businesses. And so you can think about 30% of their contracts, uh, contract value needs to go to small business. So if they got a $100 million contract, 30 million of it, they need to figure out how they can subcontract it to teammates. Now they've got all sorts of great teammates they're already working with. So it's not like they're starving to find us smalls, but if you've got experience they want, et cetera, then, then you have a way to get in there. But it's really important to understand when you're setting up your plan for 2025, as an example, you want to say, how are we going after 
some of that large prime contract dollars. Or if you're too new, then you still get started, but you look out at 2026 and you say, give myself some time. Let me find out what they need. Let me start building the relationship for a year. You've got to have a marathon way of thinking about uh, government contracting success, right? It's not a sprint. It's a marathon is what we say, because it's going to take a long time. But the success will happen if you train right and you finish. Uh, but 30% is a huge amount of money, right? When you think about the 500 billion here, almost 600 billion, uh, that's 100 and uh, what is 180 billion, if I'm doing my math right, is 30%. That's more than what went to small businesses as a prime. The reason the government put this in place is because they recognize that they award those massive contracts to largest. And they're like, look, you got to stick with the Small Business Act and make sure you're uh, covering down. So anyways, that's a huge thing. The thing about largest, though, is they are the most risk averse. Smalls are most willing to work with you. Agencies are second most willing and the largest don't want to work with you unless they have to. Uh, because first off, because they want to keep the money themselves. It's just normal for largest. They got to report to their stockholders. But most importantly, they're risk averse. They're very concerned about we have this contract to support the government's mission. We are scared of bringing in small businesses in particular who say they can do the work and then fall down. And the reason they're scared is a valid reason because smalls have come in and fall down on the job before. It's not me, it's not you, but that gives them the fear for it, which is fine. There's ways to overcome that fear uh, or those objections, right? To demonstrate you're a good company. And this is what I put in bullet four. When you're thinking about knocking on the door with larges and building relationships with large businesses, it's not just this person you're talking to who might be a friendly person you met at a networking event, but there's other leaders and decision makers who take this relationship past the personal, hey, we had a beer or a coffee at a conference. Um, they take it past the personal and they start measuring you. They care about your back office stability. So one way they measure you is your financial stability. Do you have the, uh, the ability and the, the resources to pay your employees three, four months uh, longer than you expected to have to pay them before you got paid from the large who's waiting on the government. Um, now, if the large was squared away, they'd pay you 30 days after you submitted an invoice, whether the government paid them or not. But that's the second story. Um, but they want to know you're financially stable. So that way, you know, line of credits, things like that. That way, um, if there's situations, they don't have to worry about your people quitting because they didn't get paid or you having to tell them, hey, I can only pay you a little longer, and then they switch jobs. Um, that impacts the large, and that impacts the government's ability to support the mission. And so that's something they care about. I like to say when you go into a capability briefing and you're talking to the government, you wanna first talk about what you can do to support the mission. And when you go in and talk to a large, I like to recommend you start first with saying, here's how stable we are. Now let me tell you how we can help you. Because if you're telling them how you can help them, but they're not confident you're stable and you're just one of those other small businesses that are knocking on my door, then you haven't paid attention to what's most important to them. What's most important to them is that if they give you a subcontract, you will be able to deliver on that contract flawlessly. Um, a couple of other things about back office stability is your retention, right? That goes a little bit with financial stability, but your retention and also your recruiting, uh, uh, you know, your approach to staffing or staffing approach and recruiting approach, this ability to um, attract, recruit and onboard the right people in your company that they need to support their contract. So, you know, when you think about the whole management side of a, of a proposal, that's what larges are looking for because they're risk averse to anything going wrong with a contract. Um, and some of the ways, the other ways you can sit there and really demonstrate that you're the right teammate for them and you can start pursuing some of those federal or uh, large prime dollars is you wanna uh, just demonstrate proven past performance. And I tried to mention this earlier is uh, proven past performance builds on itself. The more diverse your past performance, in my opinion, the weaker your company. And I say that term weaker softly. The, the more related your past performance, the stronger you are. We did it here, we did it here, we did it here. We did it from this variation, this variation, right? Compared to saying I did construction, I did cyber, and I did this. It's like, wait, what are you good at, right? I'm good at getting contracts. Well, that's not what we need. We need you to be good at the work. And so you wanna make sure your past performance is relevant and related, and um, that that's what makes it proven. And then uh, a niche, you can't go into a large and say, we do everything. They do everything and they barely do everything. They know that, 
with tens of thousands of employees. And so if you're a company that has 20 or 30 employees or something or less, pick one thing. For my last company, what I said was we did SharePoint. We did all sorts of stuff. But I just said we did SharePoint. We are That's our world. And in their head, it made it really easy for them to go, oh, you can fit here. Or no, we don't have SharePoint work. But most importantly, the thing that was successful for me is we started getting called, oh, you're the SharePoint guys. You're the SharePoint guys. It's like, we sure are. Give us more contracts, right? And you want to niche down when you talk to a large prime and you're trying to pursue some of that uh, large prime revenue stream. Um, the last thing, just I, I kind of said this already to a degree, right? is larges don't care about smalls. If they did, there would not have to be rules or regulations that say you must subcontract with smalls. People in larges, some people care. I get that, but the organization does not. The organization cares about profit. In this lower case, as it relates to contracts, the larges don't care about the small or the fact that you're small or that we're gonna help them hit their numbers. They care about, can we deliver? So make sure you understand that they care about delivery on the contract the same way the government cares about um, executing their mission, right? And so it's important for us to understand that when we do, we can pursue all three revenue streams. Here's what I want you to remember from today's training. First off, it's really important to know if you're ready to prime contract. If you're not, then don't go after large uh, prime contracting either or, or subcontracting under a large. Know your place and your place uh, even if I was brand, if I started a brand new company, I got 20 years experience, I would still start in revenue stream one. I would build up a book of business like $3 million subcontracting under smalls. If I can't do that and I'm going to priming and I'm going to large primes, that means I'm, I'm chasing other things. I'm doing constructive procrastination. I'm saying this is constructive, trying to pursue a prime contract or talk to a large and all of it because it's too hard for me to find the smalls, but the smalls are winning $175 billion. There's gotta be a small that would love to have me on their team. I just gotta find them. You know, Eight out of 10 won't wanna work with me, but the two that do are out there. And if I do enough activity, I'll go after it. And, and so you wanna keep that in mind with um, knowing when you're ready to prime, it usually comes with going after smalls. No matter what size you are, the second thing I want you to remember is that uh, when you get to the right point, you should have a plan to go after all three revenue streams, including pursuing small business subcontracting. That's $175 billion. Every year, if you're a $100 million company, you should be saying to yourself, how are we getting $10 million from uh, that company? Or, or excuse me, from that revenue stream. $10 million from the $175 billion and we're a larger company and we have past performance that can help them. You can do that. So then you can really diversify your revenue streams. And the last thing again is just driving this forward. Make sure you're building relationships with smalls. Build eight strategic relationships. And if you truly find eight strategic relationships that are going after a good opportunity, and generally those people you want them to be five, 10 million and plus, right? As you're pursuing it, they need to have enough contract momentum that they're going after that you can participate. If they're smaller than 5 million, then it gets harder for there to be any room for you, right? Um, so keep that in mind as you go forward and you'll be able to have success in all three revenue streams. I do have another training you can watch. It's a strategic wheel where I talk about how do you plan for all three revenue streams? And you can find that in the previous trainings. If you're interested in working with me and my team, taking you to the next level, especially when you think about these three revenue streams, if you're doing like 2 million plus, I need you to understand you have to have traction already and you have to be willing to make an investment. Then just put workshop in the chat and I'll follow up with you. Uh, don't forget to come to tomorrow's training because I'm going to lay out the seven step process for success. And when you follow that process, it enables you to find out maybe where your weak area is, how to strengthen it so that you can start having the success you want. For all of us, just remember government contracting, it is not a secret. It's just a process. I will see you in the next training.